Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today, instead of focusing on outer space and various cosmological discoveries, we're going to focus on discoveries from the depth of the ocean right here on planet Earth. But as always, this is going to be a discovery that to some extent challenges our understanding of various biological entities and specifically understanding about viruses. Because today we're going to discuss incredible diversity and some really unexpected complexity that was accidentally discovered in a new giant virus which seems to possess extremely bizarre appendages resembling super long tails. With some of these bizarre tails being so ridiculously long that not only do they not make any sense, but they also set new records for the overall size of the virus. And so this is going to be a story about what's known as P4-1. A remarkable virus with a unique micron length tail that was accidentally discovered inside the marine ecosystem and that's essentially reshaping our understanding of life itself. But before we talk about this discovery, let's actually discuss something else we've discussed in some of the previous videos in the description when it comes to some of the most bizarre discoveries about viruses. And you can find some of these videos in the description. And so for decades, our traditional view of viruses painted them as simple inert particles, essentially genetic material encased in a protein shell whose main purpose was to hijack a cell in order to then use it for its own replication. But then biologists discovered giant viruses, a phylum known as Nucleocytovirichota, which completely appended our understanding of these bizarre organisms. Although I guess we don't even call them organisms because we actually have no idea what they are. And these viruses were extremely complex. Sometimes they were larger than typical bacteria, possessing elaborate structures and vast genomes, that very often encoded hundreds if not thousands of genes, including genes used for DNA repair, replication, transcription, and actually quite a lot of other functions. But these capabilities are usually associated with physical cells and with basically what we call life. And so here the largest known virus, Pandorovirus salinus, contained a genome with 2.5 million base pairs and was able to produce 2,500 proteins. And that's technically even more complex than some of the bacteria known to us. With this level of complexity sparking debates about is this basically a fourth domain of life? And also debates about what's the connection between these viruses and various organisms like bacteria and archaea. And while in short, as of 2025, there's of course no answer yet. We have no idea how to define this or how to explain their existence. But now into this somewhat bizarre unexplained picture enters a new candidate. And here this is actually going to be a really long picture because of its long tail. I'm going to refer to this as PAVE-1. Here this was a discovery of PAVE-1 and its host. This is a new giant virus that infects a marine organism known as Pelagodinium that's a type of a dinoflagellate. Or a type of a very common marine organism essentially made out of a single cell that we sometimes classify as plankton. And here both the virus and its host were isolated from the North Pacific Ocean, specifically at a depth of 25 meters, very close to Hawaii. And in general, dinoflagellates themselves are usually incredibly diverse, and of course play a vital role in the marine ecosystem. As plankton, they are the key contributors to the microbial food web, acting both as producers and as grazers. But they also very often form marine symbiosis, or occasionally cause what's known as the algae bloom. And so essentially they play a major role when it comes to the economy and when it comes to public health. But despite their importance, surprisingly relatively few viruses that infect dinoflagellates have been characterized so far. And so this new virus, PAVE-1, essentially provides a crucial window into the marine host virus interactions. And naturally, as the pictures here show, the most fascinating feature is the tail. Although technically this is not really a tail because we cannot call this life. So this is more of an exceptionally long, thin, tail-like structure that seems to extend up to about 2.3 micrometers, even though the actual virus is only 200 nanometers in size which of course makes this the longest appendage for any virus discovered to date. And just to put this into perspective, the previous longest virus, P74-26, had a tail of about 875 nanometers. We've actually talked about this in one of the previous videos in the description, and this was referred to as the, the Rapunzel virus, 
mostly because of its very bizarre long tail. Then there's what's known as the Chupan virus, with a tail of approximately 1.85 micrometers. But for the most part, pretty much most viruses that contain these tail-like structures usually have them much shorter, with the average being about 135 nanometers. And so here we have something that's 2300 nanometers in size, that dramatically surpasses anything we've known so far. But despite this incredible length, there seems to be this really bizarre ratio between the size of the capsid, or the size of the viral structure, and the length of the tail. If comparing the length of the tail with the capsid diameter, it seems to be about 11 to 12 times larger. And that seems to actually match for a lot of other viruses discovered previously. And right now biologists are not entirely certain if this is just a coincidence, or if there is some kind of an underlying mechanism that seems to form these ratios across various viral taxa. But at the same time they also discovered that PEV1 virus exhibits several different types of morphology or different shapes with at least five distinct configurations. You can sort of see them right here, but in essence, either a thin and long tail, or a shorter tail with variable length, or sometimes some kind of a stubby protrusion that's thicker at the base and appears to emerge from the capsid apex opposite the tail's attachment point. Sometimes they have no tail, and sometimes they possess both a long thin tail and a stubby tail. So basically a multi-tail. And this considerable variation in tail length potentially reflects different stages of development, or maybe different types of damage viruses experience while interacting with their environment. For example, the long thin tail seems to be quite fragile, and has only been observed in very fresh, unfiltered and unconcentrated samples, so it's quite possible that they all contain long tails, but they're just very easy to break. But then we have this obvious question. So what is this for though? What's the actual function and mechanism of this tail? Well, first of all, during the early infection stages, usually one to six hours following the initial infection, PEV1 uses its short tail for attachment to the host's cell surface. But, according to various microscopy studies, there seems to be no evidence that the tail is used for any kind of penetration. And instead, the entry mechanism seems to involve what's known as phagocytosis, or basically the virus seems to get eaten by the cell without realizing that it's eating the virus. And so here the tail is mostly used for the attachment, but not necessarily for anything else. And after 12 hours during the late stage of infection, especially as the cell is about to burst, which is usually what happens when viruses are done with the cell and when they're finished replicating, researchers observed a lot of non-tailed viruses, suggesting that this tail seems to develop outside of the host, possibly after the cell has been destroyed and after the virus has escaped. Which would suggest that this virus is able to generate another structure outside of the host cell, and that's actually super rare. It's actually only been seen very few times previously, when certain types of tailed viruses have been observed to create morphologies in between cellular infections outside of the cell. But right now there's no experimental evidence for any of this, and this is just an assumption. Although well, importantly, right now scientists want to understand what's the actual ecological advantage for having such a long tail, because it seems to be extremely difficult to create, and it would actually require a lot of additional energy. Well, right now the primary hypothesis suggests that this potentially increases the effective diameter of the virus, and potentially increases the probability that it's going to find some kind of a host. Or essentially, by having such a long tail, there's a much higher chance the virus is going to bump into something and then attach to it in the process. This could be particularly beneficial in a low biomass system, such as certain parts of the North Pacific Ocean, where dinoflagellates might be distributed with a much lower density. But because of this discovery, we can now also compare this to some of the previously discovered tailed structures, just to see if this is some kind of a universal phenomenon, or if this is somehow different. And to start, it's actually important to look at one of the most common viruses out there, bacteriophage. A very well-known bacteria-infecting virus where the tiny tail seems to be crucial for host surface recognition and of course for penetration that's then also used for the delivery of genetic material inside the cell. And intriguingly, in one of the recent studies from 2024, scientists actually discovered that sometimes the immune system inside bacteria can actually attach certain proteins to the tails of these viruses, which then, surprisingly, prevents them from infecting other cells, which highlights how important these tails seem to be for the overall function of the virus. But what about other giant viruses? Well, first of all, when it comes to viral research, especially in marine environments and different types of seawater, 
In the past, researchers did discover quite a lot of unusual viral particles and something known as VLPs or virus-like particles that seem to be relatively large in size too, very often over one micrometer in length. Suggesting that this is not some kind of an isolated virus, and this is possibly a very common phenomenon that's just at the moment poorly understood. At the same time, as I've discussed in this video you can find in the description, sometimes last year, researchers discovered quite a lot of unusual shapes and unusual protrusions such as arms, star-like formations, various hairy surfaces, and even something resembling feet in many different giant viruses, with many of these features still being kind of bizarre, unexplained, and whose purpose is still unknown. And so there seems to be a vast, largely unknown diversity of external appendages and of course complex viral shapes that seems to be used for interaction with various hosts and various environments. But since these giant viruses also contain a relatively large genome for a virus, many of them also seem to contain additional functions that we've never really seen before in viral organisms. And in this particular case, for this PEV1 virus, so far researchers have already discovered genes that seem to provide a lot of additional functions. For example, stress response. Here this virus is able to create cold shock proteins and heat shock proteins that protect this virus from various types of stress or from all sorts of defensive mechanisms used by the host cell. It also surprisingly contains something known as chlorophyllase, which might be some kind of a bizarre viral gene used for breaking down chlorophyll inside cells that could then be used for energy by the virus itself. It also has a very similar gene for breaking down the cellulose of the cell and for breaking down the cell wall of the host, and even genes for what's known as tricarboxylic acid cycle, suggesting that sometimes when they need extra energy, they can use alternative types of mechanisms and alternative types of energy generation if, for example, for some reason the host is trying to defend itself and prevent the infection. In other words, they seem to have evolved a lot of ways to infect a typical host. And what's even more bizarre, they even have something known as aquaporin that then basically makes the cell move vertically through the water. Which implies that this giant virus doesn't just infect the cell, it potentially also controls its behavior, making it move upwards or downwards in the water. Now obviously it's unknown exactly what this is for and how this affects the virus and the host, but I'm sure this is something researchers will discover in some of the future studies. And so here this extensive gene set illustrates the immense metabolic capacity for this virus and also illustrates that they're able to manipulate and potentially enhance various host cellular processes for their own replication and for their own survival. And they basically turn these dinoflagellates into their own kind of like vehicles that they can use to travel around the water while replicating inside. But I guess one of the most unusual and still difficult to explain discoveries here is of course the definition itself. Here based on this complex genome and all of these very specific genes with very specific functions, this organism kind of blurs the line between what we consider living and non-living, which obviously provides certain clues to the evolution of life, but also provides a lot of super difficult to answer questions, because right now it's not clear what evolved from what and how exactly such a virus would form. Although in one of the previous videos in the description, there was actually a really bizarre hint that suggested that sometimes certain parasites might have actually started as bacteria or even actual cells and slowly devolved into viral-like structures. You can learn about this in one of the videos in the description. But here it's also pretty clear that this virus plays a huge role in controlling these dinoflagellates. It also profoundly influences nutrient cycling and the overall function of the marine ecosystems and very likely plays a really important role in reducing the number of these dinoflagellates during events such as the algae bloom. But because trying to isolate these individual viral species is still super challenging, the nature of these viruses and of course the nature of other viruses living in these ecosystems is still going to be unknown for a long time. But I guess in conclusion, this is not just another virus, it's sort of like a testament to the bizarre diversity and bizarre complexity of life, although in this case maybe quasi-life or not really life, and the unusual morphology that's been created by nature over billions of years, with this virus continuously revising our definition of life and expanding our understanding of the viral world. But since we don't actually have any real answers yet, we'll definitely come back and talk more about this once there are some additional discoveries and once we find even more bizarre giant viruses in some of the future studies. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, 
or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access. Alternatively, you can also buy the Wonderful Person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.